Let's see where this will work best. Yeah, the two things I wanted to cover really was preparation, which I think is the most important thing. You know, be prepared to go in. Um, the, the various places we work, some dangers are really quite obvious, right? Uh, there's just no question about it. And you take the obvious steps to, to protect yourself. Um, other places, um, it might not be so obvious. Um, you might not know that it's pretty much standard procedure that after prayers on Friday, something's going to happen in the old city of Jerusalem. And journalists all know this, and they're all hanging out there waiting for something to happen. But you never, you never know when it's going to happen. And we all know it's a beautiful world, uh, but we need to be prepared for threats, <laughs> big and small, even in places that don't seem hostile. And, you know, a lot of journalists take hostile environment training. Um, so I did like five days. So I would learn like how artillery comes in and where you park your car so you can get the hell out of there really fast and all that kind of stuff. Um, but there's a lot of places that aren't war zones that can also be hostile to people. Um, you could be in an area where there's just a lot of theft and crime, kidnapping. Kidnapping is a huge issue. It was, it was my scariest moment in hostile environment training. I really had never considered the possibility of what being kidnapped would be like. General lawlessness in some places, just weak policing. Um, so, you know, depending on who you are, some places in this country. Terrorism, civil war, civil strife. Um, street demonstrations can be really the most unpredictable. You never know what direction they're going to go in. Sexual assault, which we will deal with here. Health issues, we're not going to deal with, I don't think, much uh, here um, at all. That's kind of a whole other issue. Traffic accidents, seriously, probably the most dangerous place to be anywhere. In the, well, I've read this statistic. I don't know how true it is. The most dangerous place to be anywhere in the world is in one of those little mini buses. You know, the little mini buses that hold about 10 people and are usually jammed with about 25? Those, uh, they are accidents all the time. The drivers are not are not um, licensed, the, the vehicles are not licensed, those are really dangerous places. And a lot of especially young people use these a lot because they're really cheap and they're really a great way to get to know a country, but they're very dangerous. Um, sometimes people are just hostile to you or your activities for whatever reason. Um, so, uh, you know, how do we deal with all these possible threats that are out there in the world? Mostly through preparation and through situational awareness. Um, and of course, this is very general because it's a big world out there. And, you know, any kind of, of um, hostile environment you may experience in Indonesia is not going to be the same in Brazil or Algeria or Turkey. Every place is different. Every single place in the world is different. And that's why what you do when you're there and what you take with you or how you prepare to go is going to vary um, on, on what's there and what you might have access to there. Okay, in Dubai, probably no problem finding antibiotics, right? Um, Madagascar, more difficult, which is why I ran to, I decided it was going to be easier to buy antibiotics from a pharmacy in a mall in Dubai than trying to get a doctor here to prescribe a wide spectrum antibiotic before I went to Madagascar just in case whatever came up, right? So you're always thinking about where you're going to go. Um, so you might not have to bother getting a whole bunch of stuff if you're going to be hanging out in Dubai for two weeks before you go somewhere else. You can get whatever you need there. In a lot of countries, you can get whatever you need. Some places you can't. I love Madagascar, but I'm not going to find antibiotics anywhere near that lovely, lovely place. So before you go, first thing to do, read everything you can get your hands on about that place. It really, really is important. And I try to emphasize this with students that, you know, you can read more than just your telephone and, and you can get some really helpful stuff. Um, what are the conditions there? Where exactly will you be? There's going to be a difference between the capital city and, and a tiny village, you know, in the periphery, periphery. So, you know, think about where you're going to be. Make contacts before you leave. That's so much easier now. You guys have no idea how much easier it is to set up um, contacts before you get there. Line up your translators, any fixers, transportation you might need, hotels. Um, all this you can, you can do ahead of time, and you can talk to other people. Where do you suggest staying? Where did you stay when you were there? How, you know, did you need a translator? Who did you work with? 
who else is on your team? Those of you um, working, I think, in, in um, archaeological teams, and you know, a lot of you will be working in teams. Who are the people on your team? What are their numbers? How can you contact them? No local laws. Um, you know, if you're walking drunk down the street uh, on Fourth Avenue in Tucson, you might not have a hard time. If you're staggering drunk down the street, even in Dubai, you might have a hard time. You need to know what the local laws are. Um, and it just depends, you know, are Americans or Western people of color, gay people, whatever you happen to be, are you more likely to be protected or preyed upon in the place you're going to be? In some places, that American passport is going to help you out. In other places, it's not at all. So these are all things you have to think about. So generalized uh, advice here. But before you leave, do your U of A paperwork. Um, we all hate it. Um, but it, it, it will provide you help if you really need it. And if you're an employee, you will get workman's comp if you are injured. So there really are reasons for it all. And, um, and so do that. Do, do it often. Do it early. Um, go check out, what's the page, Laura? For, for the pay, all the paperwork. Um, for the travel authorization. That's easy. Um, <laughs> if, if you Google in travel authorization, you'll get there. You'll go around in circles a while, but you'll finally figure it out. If you put in UA International, if you Google UA International Travel Registry, it'll pop right up. Okay, good, good. No, but you do have to have, if you're, if you're working on a U of A project or for the U of A, you do need to register. And it does help because they, they're there if, you know, when there's a tsunami. Um, or, or a civil strife, they, they will help you out. Make sure your passport is good for six months after you return. A lot of countries require this. I don't know why, I don't get it, but they do. So I'm leaving, inshallah, for Iraq in January, so I can get out of the country, but my passport expires in April. So I'm, I'm gonna have a hard time getting back into the US if I haven't expired. So when I was writing this up, I was thinking, oh, I gotta get my passport. <laughs> um, get, <laughs> I know, I really, I was going, it's in 17 sometime, but when? So yeah, so um, get your vaccinations. Ch the UA travel, the UA has a travel clinic. It's a very long wait, as I recall. It's completely worthless every time I've tried to use it because it's such a long wait. But it is there, I believe. You can check it out. They will give you vaccinations. Check the website of the State Department for the country you're going to. A lot of us who work in the Middle East, these nice arid areas, not many diseases. We're pretty well off. Um, but when I started moving into Africa, that's when you need to be more concerned about things like malaria. Um, typhoid fever, things like that, that you really, and of course tetanus shots you always want. So anyway, check out the website of the State Department. Um, take with you all the prescription drugs you're going to need, right? I'm going to be gone for six months, so I'm, I'm starting to figure out now how I'm going to convince my insurance company to give me six months because they, they don't like to do that. They don't like to give you more than one month, so I'm already starting to plan that out. Um, take contraception, take tampons. There are places in the world where you still can't get tampons and that can be really uncomfortable for some people. Get a basic medical kit or put one together yourself. You really do want band-aids, you do want alcohol swabs, you want all the basic stuff. Check on medical insurance. Are you in a place where you may have to be evac evacuated? If so, do you, does your insurance cover it? And again, the U of A, um, now for study abroad programs and stuff, has a medical plan, and it's gotten much easier, but, but check that out. You really do want to know. A lot of places in the world, you're gonna get medical care very good and very cheap, um, but that's not always true everywhere, so know it, and know, and know what's near you. A cell phone plan, um, are you going to need to, I have several little cheap Nokia phones that I use in a lot of different countries. I've used them in Mexico, in uh, Jordan, Egypt, Dubai. You buy a SIM card there and put it in your little Nokia phone. Now what's fairly new is a lot of countries now, you, you can get your cell plan here to extend, but it's usually more European 
countries. I think it was available to me in Cyprus when I was there this summer, but I, but I wasn't going to need it there because I was only there a couple weeks. It wasn't available in Iraq. Um, so there are some countries it may be available and some not. And I thought it was fairly cheap. So if you're only gone for a month, it's probably worth spending the extra 30 or 40 bucks to get Verizon to, you know, extend your, your, self, your cell uh, phone plan. Otherwise, you do need to get a SIM card in another country. I always get local people. You go into, you know, Asia Cell or whoever, whoever the local thing is, sit down, and it's usually for 25 bucks you've got yourself um, a functioning cell phone locally. Before you go, make copies of everything. Your credit card, your passport, color copies, credit cards, passport, your list of contacts, your, if, you know, letters of intro sound really crazy, but in some countries, especially authoritarian type countries, really helps to have a little letter of introduction. This is so-and-so from the University of Arizona. She'll be working with the University of whatever Blah, blah, you know, that kind of thing helps. It impresses some people. So I recommend them. Make sure you've got all your prescriptions, medical prescriptions, glasses, contact lenses. I was once blind for about four months, and not four months, about four or five weeks in Mexico because I lost my contacts and my glasses were stolen. I really was blind. Um, and that, that became my first experience, actually, of going, going in and pretending and trying to pass. So I was trying to pass for Mexican by not speaking uh, because my Spanish um, was not sufficient to sound local. And my friend who was with me, he did all the negotiating to get the, the new glasses. So that's why I, I realize you can try to pass, but smarter if you have your prescription with you. So think of all the stuff you might need. Electrical outlets, do you need a converter? Do you need to convert energy? Right, because the U.S. is 110, most countries are 220. Most of our electronic will handle either one. Most of our laptops anymore, our cell phones will handle any electrical, but you're still going to need um, the particular plug. Okay, American plug-in is not going to work there, and every country is different. There's great websites now that'll show you exactly which ones are in which countries. And, and usually when I get to a country, I just buy, you know, you can buy them for like usually, you know, 30 cents, a dollar, whatever, and just keep those with you. A lot of people also carry um, just a little extension cord so that you can plug in three or four of your things and then just have one, uh, you know, outlet going into the wall. So think about the things you'll need. Um, I consider a bottle opener um, really crucial. The last thing you want is to get to your hotel room at 11 o'clock at night with, you know, you've found a nice cold bottle of beer and you've got nothing to open it with. So <laughs> that only happens once, right? No, so I always carry something. You know, you just want copies of everything. Um, my best advice, um, I'm not very fond of Nescafe. So now Starbucks, I'm not very fond of Starbucks either, except that they make these little portable packets of instant coffee that's so much better than Nescafe. So I just take a whole pack of those with me. Anything you don't want stolen, anything that's important to you, carry it on the plane. And I see a lot of people, and especially students, just with one little bag with them, and I think, God, where's all their stuff? Um, for me, cameras, recorders, anything that's important to you, all of your money, your money should always be carried on you, but in several different places. You know, some in a pocket, some in your purse, some in your carry-on, um, your laptop, your phone, any electronic equipment, a change of clothes if you're traveling any distance at all. Um, you know, your contact lenses, glasses, toothbrush, prescription drugs, just have all that stuff in your carry-on with you. So, so, I mean, my philosophy is if my suitcase doesn't arrive, which actually coming back this summer from Iraq, my suitcase didn't arrive for more than five days here in the U.S. Turkish Air did everything perfectly. I got to American Airlines. They totally screwed it up. So from Chicago to Tucson, no suitcase. So a week without it. But I had everything that I really needed. So I had dirty clothes and the other thing. But, you know, so always think about that. Your credit card, your ATM card. Tell your bank you're leaving. You guys have probably all figured that out. Because you can get, I can't tell you how many times I've been in other countries, and, and you use your credit card once, and then they put the kibosh on it. You can't use it anymore because your bank's going, oh, my God, they're in Turkey. It must have been stolen. So, boom, they stop your credit card. Call them before you leave. 
um, for me, other absolute things, I, ha I have to have granola bars. I just always take Nature Valley granola bars. They don't have frosting. They don't melt in the sun. I never, ever leave my hotel room or anywhere without granola bars and water. Two things. I'm never without granola bars and water. Kleenex packets. Got to have those little Kleenex packets. Um, hand sanitizer or wipes. You know, the wipes you can use to wipe down, you know, the remote control in your sleazy hotel room, doorknobs, whatever. I think the wipes are really, really handy. Sunglasses, cheap Nokia phone, again, headlamps. I think headlamps are wonderful. And I buy them like three for 20 bucks at Costco, and then I always have three with me. I, headlamps are really handy, and they're small. When you're arriving, who is picking you up? You need to have a plan. Have you ever uh, gone into an airport or a bus terminal and had 50 taxi drivers swamp, right? Where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going, ma'am? Where are you going? And oh my God, it'll drive you crazy. And it can work, and sometimes it's perfectly fine, and sometimes you're perfectly safe, and it's really cheap and it's really effective. But I'm telling you, if you've made a long trip, there's nothing better than having someone standing there with your little name. Even fairly crappy hotels, they'll arrange a taxi or, or a driver for you. In a lot of countries, um, taxis can be really dangerous. This was true in parts of Latin America for a while. A taxi driver could sell you up, right? To, to, you know, he'll sell you for 40 bucks, somebody else buys you for 100, somebody else buys you for 1,000, and they're finally, they're in a position where they can negotiate to make money off of you. This doesn't happen often, but you need to be aware in some places it does. So um, it really, really helps too. I was supposed to have a driver pick me up. Um, we were working with this travel agent in India. I was getting in at like five in the morning. Somebody was supposed to be there and nobody was. There was just nobody. I thought, well, screw it. I knew the name of my hotel. I didn't have it written down. I certainly didn't have it written down in a local language, which I highly recommend. Have the name of your hotel, have the phone number, have the address and in the local language if you can. Uh, Cause that way you can hand it to a cab driver who may read Arabic um, or somebody else who will read it to the cab driver. Okay, so I'm standing there, it's barely, barely not dark anymore, and I go out and I say, okay, I'll go find a taxi. I walk outside, whomp, I'm totally inundated by cab drivers. I have no idea how far it is to my hotel. Stupid on my part, because I trusted this travel agency that the, the group I was working with had, had arranged with. Um, so I just, you know, I ran back into the airport, and luckily there's a guy I'd been talk, chatting with on the plane who was a local. He had been working in the U.S. and was going back home to Hyderabad, and I'd been chatting with him on the phone. So I saw him in the airport, and I said, I can't remember his name. I said, oh, my God, can I please use your phone to call my hotel, blah, 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 and I couldn't get through on the hotel. Anyway, he said, listen, the thing about the taxis, if you go downstairs, it's the premium taxis, and they'll be very polite, and you'll go to a window, and they'll, they'll get a taxi for you. If you go straight out front here, it's all the guys. So I didn't know that, but he knew that, and that was great advice. So I went downstairs and got the premium taxi. It was still cheap. Um, so those are little kinds of things that you just you don't know. Where to stay? Hotels, guest houses, group houses. Look for what is safe and secure, but not ostentatious. The very fancy Serena Hotel in Kabul was 300 bucks a night. I could never afford to stay there, and thank God, because it was brutally attacked and a bunch of people killed. Um, so, and, and you know, it was well known for having the best security in Kabul, and that's why it was so expensive. Didn't protect them. So, you know, you want to look for a place that is modest enough not to be a target, but for me, still clean, still secure. There's stuff I look for. Are there guards or metal detectors? And you know, a lot of places, um, I, we used to laugh in Egypt, every building had a metal detector in it, and I never saw one that actually worked, ever. Not one, <laughs> right? I mean, it, it seemed to be like a status symbol. You had to have a metal detector. It's the same in Iraq right now, half of them don't work. Um, but, but look to see if there's some way that people are filtering out who's going in and out of the hotel. Um, look for a way to escape from the room if you need to. Is there a balcony? Can you, can you climb down from that balcony? Okay? If you don't want to be on the ground floor, it's easy for people to break into your hotel room. You don't want to be on the 10th floor either, because if you have to jump, you're screwed. 
I was on the 10th floor in Iraq this, this summer, and I happened to be, a friend of mine is scared to death of um, elevators, mostly because she lives in Egypt, so it's, it's a, a righteous fear, I think. So she wouldn't take the elevator. Um, and I would take the elevator up and down, but every time the electricity shifted over from the national grid to the generators, which it did twice a day, the elevator would stop. And several times I got stuck in that elevator, you know, like on the... So I started using the stairwells too. Make sure there are stairwells in your hotel, okay? You want, you prefer a room, you prefer a hotel that like has a courtyard, and so the rooms are on the inside around the courtyard, not on the outside on a street where somebody can just pull a car up and a bomb will go off. Um, now, again, some places you don't have to think about these things. Personally, I think Wi-Fi is essential. i got to have it. Um, TV, I really like. When the coup was going on in Turkey, I really wish I'd had a TV just to see how it was being covered. But we had Wi-Fi, so. Before you go in, have an exit plan. Know how the hell you're going to get out of there in case something goes wrong. And I just read about this recently, um, about getting visas ahead of time to nearby countries. I had never thought of that. And that makes perfect sense. Um, but of course, I'm headed to Iraq, so I'm thinking, mm, Iran, no. Syria, no. <laughs> Turkey, maybe. And Turkey, Turkish, and that's what I'll probably do. Turkish visas are actually easy to get. They're like, you know, 20 bucks. You can get it online. Um, they may have changed that, though, because that was pre, pre-coup. Um, so anyway, just just have just think about that. Where are the airports? Where are the bus terminals? What's near you? Who are drivers you can call? Just in case something happens, take cash. I travel with American dollars, and some places you might want euros and local cash. You know, when you're in a jam, money's probably going to help you get out of it um, in a lot of places. If you're in a really dicey place, prepare a flea bag. I call it a flea bag. Other people call it a grab bag. <laughs> and I thought this all up by myself when I was sitting in a hotel room by myself in Kurdistan uh, when Saddam was still in power. And I got this really cryptic message, and I thought, oh, shit. If I have to run, where is everything? So you want your pass, and so you can keep all this stuff in a small bag in your hotel room. You can just grab it if you need to, right? The clothes you can live without. You want a passport and copies of your passports and visas. You want cash. If you can afford it, keep $1,000 set aside. It's a lot for most students. Um, you want working communication. So you want a charged up cell phone and a charger. So that's a great place for that extra Nokia. Make sure it's charged up. Make sure it's got a local SIM card. If you're not using it, stick it in there. Your list of contacts and phone numbers written down. If you lose your phone, if your phone is stolen, you've got to have that stuff written down. Credit card, water, flashlight, headlamp. Headlamp's just good everywhere. Pocket knife, dried fruits. Um, these are just the essential things you need in case you really do need to run. And if you put it in one bag and put it in a bag that can be locked, you can just leave it in your hotel room. And I've run into a lot of, um, a lot, a lot of colleagues. We have this endless debate. Should you always carry your passport on you? Or do you not carry your passport on you and leave it locked in the hotel room because you're afraid you'll lose it if you always carry it on you? And everyone has a different opinion. Um, how many of you experienced people carry it on you at all times? Yeah, see, I don't. I leave it locked in the hotel room. I leave a copy. Actually, I was in Mexico City once, and um, it was some tourist site, and they weren't going to let me in unless I could show my passport because apparently only tourists could get in there. So I had a copy on me. Um, this was in day F. I was really surprised. It was the National Palace or something. But I had my copy, and that seemed to, to satisfy him. Don't ever forget the local people you're working with, your local colleagues. You've got to protect them. And you, being an American there, may be putting them in danger. So you always have to think about them. Always think about them. Quickly, situational awareness. Um, you've got to be aware of what's around you. Who's this guy? Middle, meanest people you should know. Who's the blind sheikh? Abdurrahman. Mm. Abdurrahman, right? Um, well, I was at a demonstration and I happened to, I looked up and I was with all these guys with big beards and they were waving around his picture and I thought, 
ah, these are not the kind of guys I want to hang out nearby. Um, so um, he, was, he was the one who's been accused of orchestrating the, the first bombing of the Twin Towers. Pretty radical Islamists. And this was a big demonstration of the Muslim Brotherhood in Cairo. And it was me and 100,000 guys with big beards. So it was a good party. Um, always be aware of where you are, OK? Just be aware. And, and we are all so accustomed now to walking around like this. Can't do that. You've got, you've got to be aware of what's around you. I can't tell you how many students I've almost mowed down in my car because they're just like walking into the street like this. And I'm thinking, for God's sake, at least look up. What happened to look both ways? So hostile, as we said before, hostile can mean a lot of places. Um, it can simply be working among a population that's hostile to you for whatever reason. Reporters run into that all the time. We've started talking to our students who will be covering the election on Tuesday. Okay, there could be um, some hostile activity um, in some places. You don't know, you hope not, you don't, you know, but you gotta think that it's possible. So there's a lot of reason why people might not like you. You're a woman, you're a Westerner, you're black, you're brown, you're an imperialist running dog, whatever you are, Somebody may not like you, so <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> Peerless run. <right. laughs> so, so you know, there's going to be people who don't like you. So you always just have to be aware. Situational awareness. Just think about your surroundings. Just be aware of what's going on around you. Um, sometimes you may need to adjust your behavior, and, and I'm sure a lot of you, you know, uh, we Americans, we move big, we talk big, we're loud, you know, that's just us, some of us. Um, so you might want to be, you know, dress a little more conservatively, you might want to be a little more demure, you might want to speak a little more softly. Um, just always think about this. Um, understand, again, read everything you can, talk to people. Local people, people who've been there before, they know. Talk to people. Recognize that there may or may not be a threat. Don't live in denial, which is, which is my favorite path, frankly. But um, it's not very smart. But you don't want to be paranoid either. Just because people are different from you doesn't mean they're a threat to you. So that's, you know, there's always this balance of, and I think most of us are here because we really enjoy dealing with other countries, other people, other cultures. That's, that's what we all love and that's what we're all devoted to. So, you know, but you can't be stupid, um, but you don't want to be paranoid either. So you're always trying to balance this stuff out. Um, and if you're, if you're not being aware, you might not even notice the obvious threats. If you don't speak the language, how do you know what people around you are saying? Um, you listen very carefully for the tone of voice. Uh, you have a good translator or a good fixer with you. Am I going way over time? Am I okay? Okay, one more minute. Um, let me, I just want to give you an example of this about the local language. I was on the streets of Baghdad, and I was with our driver and uh, one of my colleagues. Both of them spoke Arabic fluently. But they were Kurds from the north, so they were not speaking a Baghdadi accented Kurd, uh, accented a Baghdadi accented Arabic. I was with a woman who was a translator. She was there working with several um, uh, journalists in, in Iraq. She was Egyptian, and she had she had gone off the deep end. She had just totally fallen in love with the Iraqi people and with the Americans, and she thought this was just a wonderful thing, and we <laughs> that the Americans were there. Um, so we're standing on the street. We'd stopped to buy nuts from one of the little nut vendors on the street. And we're standing there, and I'm, you know, everyone's in Arabic. And I had developed the habit of not speaking because my Arabic was really bad. And, and it, it immediately identifies me as not being from there. So if I just shut up, sometimes I can pass. So I, I was in the habit of not speaking in English when we were on the streets, um, unless we felt in a really safe place. So I'm kind of feeling things kind of get tense. So there's the nut vendor, and there's you know my, the driver, the other Kurdish guy, the Egyptian woman, and then people are coming up, you know, from the sides, and the Egyptian translator is talking, and I just feel things get tense, and I can't say to you know my colleagues what the hell's going on, but it just feels tense, and I can hear voices right, and, and more people are coming around, so I kind of back up towards the van. And then finally, 
the fixer says, we're going now. We turn around, we all get in the van and we leave. Well, what had happened was this Egyptian translator who was so in love with the Americans was asking the Iraqis on the street, aren't you happy the Americans have come? Aren't you happy that they're now in your country? And of course they're like, fuck no, we're not happy, you know. So, yeah, they, things were getting tense, and she was just being stupid. In fact, we, we finally had, I mean, she just, she always goes overboard. She was in love with the Islamists for a while, too, because um, she knew Mohammed Atta's family in Egypt, and she would always take journalists to talk to Mohammed Atta. He was accused one of the bombers of 9-11. And, and she just totally came to see their way of looking at things, and she, we're going, my God, are you an old Islamist now? What is this? Anyway, if you don't speak the local language, especially be really really, really careful. Be around people you trust. Be around people you trust. Also, learn to trust your gut or your intuition. Your subconscious will notice signs. My subconscious noticed that I didn't understand a word people were saying, but I felt the vibes that things weren't going well on that street in Baghdad. And I've been on the street a hundred times. Everything was fine. It wasn't that time. Um, also, I really highly suggest if you're in a dodgy area at all, work in pairs, work in teams, have, have a buddy, don't be alone if you can avoid it. Really, really, if you can avoid it. I know a lot of, of uh, anthropologists probably can't. But um, if you're working in a team, you've always got one person whose job it is to just observe. Especially when you're on the street, especially when you're in demonstrations, it's really helpful to have somebody whose job it is just to keep an eye out on everything else while you're doing your work. You're doing your job. You're talking to people. You're shooting photos. You're trying to find an office. Whatever it is you're doing, you can focus on that and somebody else. Okay, so to wrap it up, be prepared. Do the advance work. Practice situational awareness means make a conscious effort to be aware, to think about what's going on around you. Questions? Can it be darker in here? Because I have, like... Data kind of stuff. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. So, in thinking about passports, I realize I usually carry mine in the United States as well because I never know which way I want to escape. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> I just keep my. I just keep my. <laughs> Anyhow, um, right. So, I'm a, I'm an archaeologist. I do field work in the Middle East, me personally in Israel, but um, so my. My, my people work all around Middle East, North Africa, Mediterranean Basin. In 2014, I got involved in pr investigating the problem of safety in the field for female archaeologists, um, a subject I had never thought about. I mean, I had experienced things everybody does, and we all sit around and tell stories, and you know, we know what the problems are, but I never thought about this systemically at all until um, I read the work in uh, 2014 by um, a group of physical, uh, biological anthropologists, um, Catherine Clancy and three others who reported on uh, their experiences and the experiences of others. They did a huge survey um, doing biological anthropological research out in the field in remote locations. And they said, and Clancy wrote, quote, undergraduates, graduates, po graduate students, postdocs, and faculty report sexual harassment and assault, not only by their peers, but by their bosses and mentors in the field. Um, she blogged about their work in Scientific American, and she, they, it's been published in PLOS One, so there are places to read their information, data, anecdotes from people, and, and so forth. And it was like a bolt of lightning had hit me. All of a sudden, I thought, whoa, why aren't I worrying about this? Um, I, had a, I have a good platform. I have a good platform to worry about it from. I'm on the board, or I was for a dozen years, of American Schools of Oriental Research, which is the professional association for us Middle Eastern, North Africa. African archaeologists, and um, because I'm always talking about women working in the profession of archaeology in modern times, that the present, past president created something that he called Initiative on the Status of Women, 
in Middle Eastern archaeology, something like that, and made me the head of it, which I was delighted to do. It's a little bit of a committee of one, but I do have other people who work with me on different kinds of projects that I'm doing. Um, this field safety thing has kind of been my, um, my own project. And it took me a while to convince people that this was something that needed to be studied systemically. At first, I got a lot of I, I'm kind of busy. Is there something? Could you speak a little faster about it? But eventually, you know, people were sold on the idea that this was a subject that was important to the success of our field. You couldn't continue to have archaeological field work and not worry about the safety of staff, of volunteers, of hired excavators and, and workers on sites. So. I work with dead people. I work with people who've been dead a really, really, really long time. That's how I, with all due respect, that's kind of how I like my people. Um, <laughs> right. Um, I mean, I love my family. I love my friends, colleagues, but uh, my research. So I did all of that human IRB training and got set to work with living subjects. And I launched a survey, thanks to Qualtrics, thanks to um, the great support that I got on campus in figuring out how to do this. And so I launched a survey with the very mundane title, Survey on Field Safety, Middle East, North Africa, and the Mediterranean Basin. I sent it out in 2014. I sent it out again in 2015. And so by now, I have several hundred not maybe not 300, but well more than 200. Our field is pretty small, so it was a substantial enough body of response that I have information. I don't need statistical data. I don't have to show this is 27% more dangerous than that. This isn't really what matters. It was just finding out what are the problems, getting information from people. So. I, I launched it in like 12 million places. These are just some of the. Um, ways I got it out, but I, I, I blasted it, and I blasted it around so much that eventually a colleague in the anthro department told me she had received a copy of it from someone in Madagascar. So I knew it had traveled the world, and I was getting a lot of a lot of a lot of good info back. So let me show you. Oh, I also w have been working with people in a number of professional societies which some of which have for a while or or organizations of archaeologists have had something about status of women and something about women in not so much about women in field work but everyone's getting more interested in this for all the obvious reasons so let me show you what i discovered and in doing that i think i can i think by looking at this i won't like read all the lists and so forth but i think you'll be able to observe what kinds of things create risk what kinds of things are healthful or safe things to do and what are the problems involved in all of this? So my demographics, I had responses from people um, who resided or worked in 24 countries. Uh, just over half were between the ages of 22 and, 20, and 39. 63% female, 37% male. No respondent self-identified as transgendered. 90% heterosexual, 4% lesbian or gay, 4% bisexual, and 2% other. The one thing I forgot in, a, in, a, in the first time around was to find out whether people were married or in that kind of long-term partner relationship. It would have been helpful, but whatever. I caught, I caught it the next year. Education and employment. So. 5% high school degree was the highest degree obtained. This is fine. I mean, we're doing archaeological field work. Lots of it is manual labor. You don't need a PhD to be able to dig in the field. You just need to be passionate and take direction. 14% had BAs, 31% masters, 47% doctorates. Um, there were more than 30 different professional or academic statuses that people um, had, most of them related to archaeology, but archaeology in the Middle East is often felt as something very romantic. I don't know about other parts of the world. People want to uncover the land of the Bible or find their ancestors or they're crazy about Italy and they want to see something in Rome, so they're a completely other thing. 
I'm a lawyer, I always wanted to be an archaeologist, but now I can afford to just go dig for the summers, something like that. So we get other people in other businesses as well who just come work with us. Field work. Respondents working in 22, were working in 22 different countries in the regions I um, looked at, and they had within their own professional, these are the professional archaeologists, they listed 50 different areas of specialization. Um, it was huge. It was something that couldn't be like sorted down. So um, you can see this is a pretty broad spectrum of um, response and of kinds of interest. 19%, I wanted to know where did people work? City, country, remote, whatever. So 19% of the field projects were in urban settings. That's maybe for all the obvious reasons the least commonplace to work because there are buildings you gotta deal with. The rest in rural or isolated settings. Most of the people who responded had worked for four or more years on the projects they were discussing. People generally responded about a single project, although many of us archaeologists have worked, like we've worked in 20 countries, and you know we, we may do the same, lots of different projects and lots of different countries as well. Um, the responsibilities of these people range from dig director or co-director, 19%, to volunteer or paid digger, 15%, and a range of positions in between, which you can see down at the bottom. Um, for the excavations that I learned about, 40% had no female director or co-director, 21% had no male um, director or co-director. Um, the idea of a female director or co-director is totally modern. So if I had run this survey 15 years ago, I wouldn't have had even, even as high a number as I had, let alone 30 years ago. Excavation staff was split fairly even by gender. More women than men were dig volunteers. Almost no paid workers, laborers who are doing um, manual labor, clearing sites and things like that. Almost none of those are, are women. And it is true that we discover, of course, that many more women study archaeology and many more men are successful in the field. That's a Maybe different, that's that's right. right, right, well, yeah, <laughs> that's a different topic I'm also working on. If you want to come back to that one next semester, I'm there. So let's look at field safety. I asked the question, does, your ex, does the excavation project you're talking about have a code of conduct? And almost half of them had a code of conduct that had some value. Um, I, people had heard of it. I consider that valued enough if people have actually heard of it. Just over half those codes included information on sexual violations. Nearly half the codes mandated reporting for violations, but less than half mandated follow-up and repercussions for the violations that were reported. To the extent that there were repercussions, two-thirds of respondents um, two-thirds of, of those repercussions were perceived, only two-thirds, were perceived as meeting excavation, university, or other legal codes. Appropriate health care was available at only three-quarters of the digs, and 17, only 17% 17 of digs had ombuds people. Um, Although I think that just my having asked that question, a lot of dig directors said, oh wow, that would be a good idea, someone who can help resolve problems before they get too serious. What was excavation culture like? About one-fifth of digs were described as accepting of sexual violations, and some people felt compelled to hide aspects of their sexual orientation or gender identity. I'm not talking about out in the country, wherever you are, I'm talking about on the field site, which can be an isolated site. You're just, you know, you and 30 other people living in a tent camp or whatever. So I'm not talking about local culture. I'm talking about excavation culture. Um, drug and alcohol abuse was a problem on 58% of the digs. And one of the important points I'm going to emphasize a few times is if you want to stay safe, stay safe. Stay away from booze and stay away from people who drink. 
Um, yeah. Additional in problems, violence, 22%, racial and or religious harassment, 29%, theft, 25%, vandalism reported 14%, Expropriation of professional contributions, your work taken by your dig director or your area supervisor, 25%, and then that wonderful category of other, um, 22%. Wait, did I miss? No, I'm okay. Um, Many people witnessed or experienced comments of a harassing or intimidating nature these included inappropriate or hateful sexual remarks, negative comments on physical attributes, dress, gender, sexual orientation, and gender presentation. All right, I think I have not quite been advancing. Oh, here we go. Nearly a third of respondents reported discrimination in field work and post-field work assignments and opportunities based on gender, sexual orientation, and or gender identity. Um, meaning that often for us, we do field work and then we hope as students, particularly maybe as, as you know, people more advanced in the professional world, to be able to quote unquote take that material home and publish it, to do our research on it, to publish it, to have some authority over it. Okay, so nearly a third of the people thought that gender, one of those things prevented them from being assigned the work that was their you know, their product to work in. Just over half perceived excavation standards, expectations, and awards to be equitably managed. Um, about one-fifth of respondents witnessed or experienced physical assault or physical violence. Many of the perpetrators of these assaults were individuals in positions of authority on the excavation. Can I say that a few more times? People of, in positions of authority on the excavations. The responses to those violations that were reported, whether they were reported in the field or after the field season, were wide ranging. Here is some of the questions about were violations reported and people said things like there's no mechanism to report or why even bother reporting, nobody's going to do anything. Um, there are a lot of issues in reporting and I want to, I'll talk about them a drop afterwards, but fear of reporting was a huge factor for people in the field because we're so isolated, because we're in a foreign country, because we're, you know, you, you have a ticket that you, you may not be able to, without all those reasons, after the dig, sometimes people reported and, the, and then their reporting also rarely did them any good. And I've heard many anecdotal stories and I did formal interviews with people and I heard quite a lot of this. It was incredibly disturbing to say the least. So. A number of people um, reported ambivalence about, uh, all right, I've talked about this, all the consequences of reporting as well. You report and then something bad happens to you. This is an old story. This is a story we all live with. This is something that we all fear. I say the right thing. I do the right thing. I get screwed. Uh, the person who did the wrong thing gets promoted. Um, it's often the way of the world. So. And so people end up going back to those same digs because they built a home there, they built a space there. That's where their university sends them for all kinds of reasons. That's where their research is. So you may be introduced season after season to problems that you can't really um, manage. So one of the things I've been trying to do, in addition to documenting and quantifying, which I've got you know, plenty more statistics as well, is to figure out what are the factors that will contribute to safe and unsafe field work experiences and environments. What are the best practices to um, use to implement and, and support safe 
experiences on digs. I'm working to develop standards, policies, protocols, trainings to educate and inform everybody from the you know, college you know, undergraduate volunteer to the dig directors about, about ethics, laws, and so forth. And I'm working with ASOR, American Schools of Oriental Research, which will give me a form to post all of the, you know, all of what I come up with on this trainings and so forth. So I really thought, I have identified a problem, and it's a common problem, and it's not only happening in the Middle East, it's happening for the archaeologists of the classical world, of the Mesoamerican world. It's probably happening every place and to everybody. This is, you know, and University of Arizona, among a million universities, sends students out into the out into the world to engage in field projects or to do study abroad. So I began talking to people on this campus thinking, great, they're going to have neat packets of information and they will be able to show them to me because there is the Title IX um, protection laws and, and the Clary Act and, and you know all of, all of this stuff exists to protect all of us. But because of the difficulties of dealing with multiple countries, each of which has its own legal system. Um, anything that happens here in this country doesn't apply abroad. So you can't call 911 everywhere. I once actually tr I was running a dig in a really remote place in the Galilee in, in northern Israel, and I did a training with the Red Cross on emergency you know, first aid stuff, and they kept saying the first thing to do is call 911. I'm like, I'm in the middle of a field. I don't have a telephone. It was before the cell phone era, and you know, what am I going to do? And we ended up throwing a kid who went unconscious into the back of, his, of a truck and taking him to his parents' house. They said, oh, would you like a cup of tea? Mm -hmm. It's probably because he slept last night without his pajama shirt. <laughs> Anyhow, um, you know, that whatever you learn to do here isn't going to help you abroad. Uh, thank heavens he was fine afterwards, but those things are scary, you know, as you guys know, and, uh, and, and these things are scary too. There really isn't a protection that's provided through the university. In, in general, there aren't protocols you can't pull up you know, I'm going abroad, here is all the things that are going to protect me. I'm working with um, an organized excavation project, whether it's organized by U of A or it's organized by another university that's American or a foreign university. You're out in the world and the resource, there, there just aren't resources and this is something I find astounding, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm I talk to people and, and I'm working with people and this campus has a new Center for the Study of Gender-Based Prevention and Violence. I'm just going to show you some of the resources on campus, including Laura. <laughs> Here you are. But um, Global Initiatives, the Study Abroad People, the Title IX People, the Office of Institutional Equity, um, who are also, that's Title IX, and then um, Dean of Students Office, and then uh, on the on the very uh, far right, Melissa Vito and Monica Casper, who are running this new Center for the Prevention of Gender-Based Violence. Everybody's working to try and figure out, because this is a problem that hadn't been thought through well enough. A colleague of mine takes students to a foreign country for a spring break trip. And I said, well, how, what's your training? And she said, they give us a phone number and tell in the state, I guess on campus, and tell us someone will be there 24 hours a day. If something goes wrong, that's really not very helpful. Um, it's not situationally based. It's not immediate and, and um, not useful. So hopefully, you know, a lot of people are, are working on these things. My last few points, you had a, a lot of last few points. I have only a few to, today. Be aware that the laws of the country you're going to are going to be different than the laws of this country, regardless of where you go. U.S. law doesn't apply even if you're on a U.S.-based project, um, a University of Arizona project. You're affiliated here. Nobody cares over there. So make sure you are aware completely, besides all the things that Professor Zanger talked about, what's the chain of command for your own project? How, are you, how will things be resolved informally, formally? Who's dealing with that? That's a fair question to ask before you go, before you sign on your precious life, your precious dollars, your precious time to a field project. Make sure that project has, has your back as well. 
what are the social customs of the country that you're going to? What are they like? And you address that some as well. I mean, generally, most people are more conservative than um, we are. How will your university help you if you leave, you know, if something happens when you're abroad? Those are, um, or how won't it help you? I mean, those are things that I think are really worth knowing. So that's what I have. I, I want to end because I know you have probably a lot to say as well, but um, I'm really interested in hearing from people, working with people, you know, anything you guys want, you'll, you now know me, you know where to find me, um, and that's great. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you about what I've been doing. I was one of the most dangerous cities in the world. So I grew up, you know, sort of learning about all these safety issues that became normal and that I didn't have to think about. Um, I knew I always had to carry some cash, but not too much cash in case I was robbed. I knew I shouldn't be wearing jewelry when I went out. Um, if I was driving past 10 o'clock at night, I never stopped in the red light. I always stopped in the green light because somebody could be waiting for you to rob you, right? You would wear your watch on the right hand if you were driving. There came a point in which you wouldn't even open your windows. But, you know, I knew where to go, where not to go, which taxis to take and which not to take. And those are things that you know when you leave in a place, right? So I always, you know, when I go somewhere, I always ask, are those taxis safe or not? Why? Because I grew up with that. So for me, it's second nature. Um, you know, I always called everywhere I arrived, I called, I'm fine, I got here fine. So that's, I always, knew, you know, made sure everybody knew or somebody knew where I was going. So those are, the, are things that I continue practicing when I, you know, go in the field as an anthropologist. But I really don't think about them that much. However, um, I think when I started going in, you know, to the field as an anthropologist, in the you know, early 1990s, it was a very different world. And I think Latin America, even though I came from a very violent city, I think almost everywhere it was different. I came here and people would be, you know, and, and one of the other things that I should emphasize is that the notion of risk is relative. The notion of personal safety is very relative. I came here and people would tell me, oh, don't go to South Tucson because it's dangerous. And I'm like, yeah, right, South Tucson. Oh, the, oh you're going to do field work in Mexico go, oh my god, it's so dangerous. This is beginning of the 1990s. It was not. It was really safe. I worked, um, I did my dissertation field work in fishing communities, working with fishermen. So a lot of people would tell me, oh my god, you're going to be with men, you know. You have to be careful. Nothing ever happened, but I think in my own mind, I always took precautions that I think we don't discuss them, we don't talk about them uh, enough. And I think um, now I have a lot more students who are, for example, doing field work in Colombia or doing field work in, in cities that are pretty dangerous, like Chris over there, <laughs> who just spent a whole year in, uh, in a very um, violent neighborhood <laughs> in Fortaleza, in Brazil. And I've had students going a lot to the field. So this is an issue that I'm starting to really to think about. What what happens when students didn't grow up in a situation where danger happens and you learn how to deal? You, you learn how to walk in the streets. Uh, and you, as you say, you're always watching, even when you're not even conscious about it, right? And you're always walking confident, because if you're not, you for sure are going to get robbed. <laughs> so, so those are the things that you learn. Um, but if you don't grow up in a situation like that, then I think it is the responsibility of our responsibility as faculty to really make sure that students know how to behave and what to expect. Um, one of the things that we do, I work at the Bureau of Applied Research in Anthropology, and one of the really good things that we do is we train students by going, you know, as before they begin their dissertation projects, they come with us to the field. And this is the time when, we, when they learned a lot about how to manage in the field. One of the things that we always do, or in general we try to do, 
is have team, uh, have uh, uh, people from the country that are going to work with our students. So I had like a six year project in, in Brazil, Paraguay and Colombia. And we contacted universities for in the three places and we said we want kids that are the same age as our students to go to the field. So we always send a male and a female together because it's always good to have a guy and women also you know, perform important roles when we work in teams. So people, if you're interviewing women, women feel less threatened if there's a woman doing the interview uh, and vice versa. So there are a lot of, 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 um, of you know, good things to learn. And these are students from the country who already know what is dangerous and what is not, who speak the language well. And in the case of Paraguay, you know, we had people who spoke Guarani in the field, other people spoke Spanish, other people spoke Portuguese, because, you know, in, in Paraguay you speak different languages. A lot of the students from, you know, the host universities spoke Guarani. So that was great. So, you know, from them, our students were learning, or our students learned how to behave. For example, the way you dress. And I tell students all the time, you, people are watching you, and people are, you know, have expectations. Oh, these American kids are coming, you know, and there are all these thoughts about what Americans look like and what they do and not, and it's all from TV, usually, right? So, I think the less or the more inconspicuous you are, the better. So I tell the students, if people wear jeans and t-shirts, that's what you should be wearing. Don't wear short shorts and then expect that, you know, if you do, you will hear all the men, you know, whistling at you and then don't get upset about it because that's how it is, right? So there are things that we need to do to make sure that we are being perceived as someone who's not, who's not harmful and who's not looking for something else. And I, and I do think for Americans it's harder because there's the, the perception, especially American women, that American women are easy. And all that comes from TV, a lot of that. So dress conservatively and be conservative. You know, I, I, we go to the field, we spend sometimes a year in the field, we get to know local people very well. I never go out drinking and get drunk with local people. I never do that. I am a professional researcher, and we have to keep that in mind. Um, if people know that we are researchers, and, and we do make clear that that's what we are, we can be, in, in, we can be doing research on drug dealing, and, and, and people will protect you, and people will you know, help you get through difficult situations. If there is a sense that this is a researcher and this is a person that, that um, I, we sort of, she's studying us and we have to protect her. So, so I say, you know, I don't want to just go up and down and look at my notes. Um, Okay, so yeah, how you present yourself. Um, also, how you introduce yourself to the community. What we always do when we go as a team, we do a sondeo, you know, we go to the town or to the place and we introduce ourselves to everybody, to the people who are empowering the town, uh, to people who are influential in the town, so everybody knows, or key people in the town knows who we are. When we're working by ourselves, we need to do the same thing. We need to go to the authorities in the town, to the mayor, or to whoever, you know, wherever you are, to the chief of, you know, if you're in an indigenous community, go and introduce yourself. Tell them who you are, what you're doing. Oftentimes we first of all ask permission to do the work and if we can if sometimes it's not possible but if we can we do a trip ahead of time ask for permission and introduce the project to the community then people know who we are and it makes a difference and usually you know there's I've been doing field work for a long time and I've been doing field work in many different countries and there's usually you know the person from the community that really is interested and, and has sort of the mind of an anthropology and they come to you and they come to you and they want to learn about you and they situate themselves as the person who's going to help you you know introduce the project who if you are doing research in a theme that is 
violence or in a context that is violent, this is the person that initially will help you go in. I always make sure that I have a good relationship with, you know, the elderly, those who are well respected in the town, because people talk. And if they say, oh, she knows so and so, ah, okay, that's fine. Right? You also need to figure out early on if there are different factions in the town, especially if you are working in violent context. And if you're working, in Latin, at least in Latin America, if you're working in violent context, the last thing that you want to do is to be too close to the police. Because oftentimes the police are the ones who are uh, creating more of the violence. And I think Chris experienced that <laughs> quite clearly in Brazil. Um, so, so you will find, you know, as people get to know you, if you're honest about your research, um, and if you really open yourself up to, you know, people asking you questions. Like when I was working with fishermen, I made sure that the women, the wives of the fishermen knew who I was. Because I didn't want them to feel that, oh my God, why is she going with them on a three-day trip? That's, women don't go out fishing, right? It's like, no. So I made sure they knew me. I made sure um, I would interview the guys in their house many times with the wife there so that they knew who I was. And nothing actually, nothing ever happened to me. You also need to be aware that um, you trust your instincts. Like you were saying, when you feel that something is not right, don't get into it. Don't get into it. You are, might end up, you know, might think oh, I'm going to lose this great opportunity for a wonderful interview. That's okay. It's not a big deal. So when I was interviewing people that I didn't know, men that I didn't know very well, I used to, you know, I would do it in a public place. And as I got to know, I would say, well, I want to, if I can go to your house, but I make sure that there was a wife and there were children and there were people around. And as I get to know, you know, the people in the town, then you, it, it becomes easier, but you have to take certain precautions. And you also have to listen to people. When people tell you, don't go there by yourself, don't, don't do it. They are telling you for a reason. And I tell you, as an outsider, people do want to protect you. A lot of people do. Because they don't want you to say when you leave their town, oh my gosh, she's going to say all these bad things about our town. So sometimes people even overprotect you, which is a good thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But you do have to listen and you do have to, mm, you know, do as people do with, I don't know, with food, water. If people are not drinking water from the tap, then don't drink it. If people do, I generally do drink, and sometimes I get sick, but, you know. But, but that, that, you know, that issue of trusting others, also people know that you trust them, and it is important to people. So you build these relationships, just like if you were here in the U.S. And people might look different, but that doesn't mean they are, they are not good people, right? Don't assume that everybody's great and everything is going to be fine. But don't assume the opposite either. So you really have, you know, like you were saying, trust your gut. And if, you, if you're too gullible, then listen to what others are telling you. Because um, you don't want to get in trouble. Um, you know, creating sort of safety zones around you is important. So I go into a place where I don't know people. And if it is, a, you know, if we're doing research on a dangerous topic, I don't go by myself. I go with somebody in the town or in the place that I already know, right, who's going to introduce me. So that's important. Then you watch the interactions around you. If you see that there is hostility, don't get involved. You're neutral. Don't get involved between people fighting about something. Just stay away from them if you can. Um, but be neutral, and people appreciate that. Uh, people sometimes, I've oftentimes become a mediator when there's a problem because I don't take sides and I make sure that people know I am a researcher, a bubble. People are going to have huge assumptions about it, about you. When I started working in Mexico, People thought I was, you know, what is she doing here? She says she's an anthropologist. Nobody knew what an anthropologist is. She's working with fishermen. That's weird, right? Mm -hmm. So they, you know, so after six months in the field, we, I was talking with a group of them. They said, well, we all thought you were looking for routes to bring cocaine into the U.S. <laughs> from Colombia. <laughs> from Colombia, what is she? 
<laughs> right? <laughs> so that was pretty interesting. I was, oh my God, I never thought anybody would think that way. <laughs> so, so but, but one thing that has happened as you know, I continue going into the field is that we, I, I start seeing situations that I didn't see before. So I went back to the Gulf of California to do research about two years ago, and I realized that you know, there was a lot of military police that are very scary. There were narcos in the town, which were never there before. So the situation had changed. I went in with a group of students. I, I always, I, I, I take certain kinds of students to some field sites and others I don't. And, and I really, it's, if I know that the student has some experience being in violent situations, then I feel better by taking that student. But if I don't, then I tell the student maybe we should do field work somewhere else. I've had um, students, I had one student from Colombia who came here to do his PhD and he went back to the Guaviare region which is very very dangerous to do his field work. He had grown up there and he left when he was uh, you know, in high school. When he came back, to, you know, many years later, he was telling me how he, he got to the field and one of the policemen recognized him from you know, high school days and said hi to him and he's like, I don't want to be, you know. So he said hi but stayed away and then there was a, a person from the guerrilla, from the FARC, who came to say hi to him because he had been in high school with him and he's like, how do I stay away from people who know me and who belong to different? So he really, he ended up allying with the missionaries, which he never thought he would. <laughs> so he became great friends with the missionaries and tried to keep a low profile. Um, so there's a lot of things, you know, that, that um, that we can do. Humor is another important uh, way of dealing with problems. And uh, when you see the you know, situations escalate and you're able to respond with humor, then you might be able to, you know, change the situation. So, but these are things that you learn by doing them. However, I think um, it is important to go in teams, and I always tell students, depending on when they are going, find and 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 be uh, find partners that are students who would be interested in the same topics that you're researching. So, like for instance, when I send students to study in Colombia or to do fieldwork in Colombia, I always contact the local university. I have a student who's going. Anybody who would. You know, inter oh yes, we have a group who's studying. I had a couple of students who have gone to Medellin, a very dangerous city, to study violence, right? So I say, okay, let's, let me call the local university. Yeah, there's a group that is look, doing, looking at violence. So they have been introduced in the community by people who have been doing research there. So that is, I think, our responsibility as professors to really make sure that the students have a network of people in the field that are going to be there. The letter is huge. I always send them with the letter saying who they are, where they are coming from. Mm. I had a student who wanted to go to this region of Colombia where there's guerrilla, paramilitaries, all that. He, I wasn't, I, when I told him no, he took me out of his committee and then I got something from IRB saying, we have this student, what do you think? And I start reading the thing, and I'm like, oh my god. He, he's red hair, <laughs> very white, and he says he's going to go in because he's interested in finding out about the lives of the guerrillas. So he's going to go in, and he's not going to let anybody know that he's there. He's not going to introduce himself to anybody in government. And I'm like, what is he thinking about? The minute that he arrives, everybody from every faction is going to know. <laughs> so I said, no, I'm sorry, but I, no, this student cannot go. We, we can't let him go, and he didn't. He ended up doing something else. But, um, so there are a lot of things to learn, and I don't know if, if, if uh, Chris wants to say something, because he just spent a whole year. <laughs> yeah. You also don't want to be paranoid and perceive threats where there are no threats because you don't want to people be know that. You don't want to be stupid. And you don't want to be stupid. You just have to find that place in the middle yeah. and it's going to be different 
in Brazil, in Mexico, in Israel, anywhere, you know, and, and at different moments, because I, yeah, a different moment. You know, I could go around and do as I wish, but after, at a certain point after the revolution, um, someone told me, just don't go walking around in the street. I said, well, I know people, I'm fine. I said, the people who know you, you're it's fine, not like that but others will see you at a distance. No matter how much you dress properly, you look you're And right. to some people, this will mean something, don't go out alone. So I didn't. No, but, but again, it's listening to what people tell you. They have reasons for it. Even though yes. I, I sort of thought, well, I can do this myself. But they said, no, you can't. <laughs> and, they were, and it's fine. Yeah. And, the, and, the, and again, knowing who is respected in the town place if it's a small town or in the neighborhood if it's a big city who is the person that everybody respects go to that person make sure that they know you make sure that you are that they know that you're okay that you're not there to tell on them or to judge people depends on the kind of research that you're doing but if people think this person is judging us or they or, or maybe this person is informing somebody else um, if people get that impression you want to make sure that they don't um, I worked again in the Gulf of California for a long time. You had, well, you had conservationist groups that went into many of these towns and they wanted people to get out of the town because they wanted to conserve resources. That has created tremendous conflict. And the last time I went, I realized, you know, there was a young man behind me the whole time in his truck, very aggressive, right? And he would yell things at me, and I'm like, then I realized, oh, he thinks I'm one of the conservationists. So I said, we need to talk. And he said, yes, you know, very, <laughs> right? And he, he, but he didn't want, he wanted to intimidate me. And he didn't want to talk to me when there were people around. So he said, well, I'll meet you at your hotel at 10 o'clock at night. And I'm like, sure, I'm not going to show you. I'm not afraid, because I wasn't afraid of him. But he wanted to intimidate me. So I called somebody in the town, and I said, he wants to meet me and I don't feel comfortable, would you come with me? And he said, sure, he's just, he's a very, you know, that's the, his personality. So everybody knows everybody. So I went with this other guy and he's like, oh, what are you doing with him? And I'm like, they, they know me, you haven't let, you know, given me a chance to explain myself. And then I, you know, I started talking to him about the years of working there and he, he realized that I was not a threat. But it took, it was important that I, negotiate that relationship with that specific person who was very angry because his family had been uh, had lost all their livelihood to these you know groups so yeah so a lot of things that we can talk about one of the things that we don't you know when we do methods class we don't I re you know I was thinking about this as I was I teach methods and I don't really talk about these issues really you know we talk about them in passing all the time but we really don't. I think more and more they are becoming very salient. Yeah, I think the yeah. things too that um, you know, we, we haven't talked about it enough, and I think it's a responsibility because even if it, an exact situation isn't um, discussed, as long as people realize there are, are possibilities that are a little more aware, if you're in a situation where you're in one place for a length of time and develop a network and people know you and protect you, that's good. But if you have, say, multi sided research where you do you know, a week here, a week there, a week there, people don't know you and don't develop that. And you have to be extra um, careful mm -hmm. about where you stay, the people you're with, do you know them? Do you really trust and understand them? Maybe you could save some money by staying in someone's house and they offer you a room overnight, but that might not be the best idea. Maybe spend a few bucks, get a, a hotel room and make sure you're safe. You know, those kinds of things that people need to think about. Mm -hmm. and, and just, you know, the, having that, that radar, I think, makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as women, I think it is really important for women to with women in the community mm -hmm. because they will. Yeah. 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 The other thing that goes on is that you don't know, I mean, when you don't know people, you don't know what pressures they have in their own communities. Mm -hmm. People can be very receptive, very hosty, very warm and friendly, but they have other pressures to deal with as well. So. And you're going to leave. So if you mm -hmm. want to go to whoever it is and, and, and register a problem or a complaint or something, it doesn't mean that they have the capacity to deal with that problem. Yeah. And if the University of Arizona doesn't 100% have our backs, then nobody has our backs mm -hmm. when we go out and do yeah. things 